I'm Ellen Myers, the Programs and Communications Director for the Newton Free Library. I will silence my mobile phone if you silence yours. Thank you very much. I want to thank our partners, Do TV, who are filming this event, so you'll be able to share it with all your family and friends. And we're delighted to have Jim back. I think this is, what, your fourth talk here or your third? He's given a talk on every one of these major hikes. Uh, so let me just say I'm sure you know that Jim left the southern terminus in the New England, I'm sorry, in the New Mexico border uh, boot heel under a broiling hot sun on April 21st, 2022 and reached the northern terminus in Glacier National Park on September 2nd, 2,700 miles and 135 days later. As he wrote in his journal, this was the hardest thing he'd ever done. And now I'd like to welcome Jim to tell you about his journey, hiking the continental divide. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to get right into it. We're going to try to keep the slide portion of it to an hour and then open it up for 15 minutes or so of questions. So just before I actually get into the pictures from the trip itself, I want to give you a bit of background on the trail itself, the Continental Divide Trail, which uh, henceforth I'll refer to as a CDT. Um, and it's a footpath from New, uh, Mexico to Canada up the spine of the Rockies. Um, its motto is embrace the brutality, and it really is <laughs> uh, a brutal trail, um, particularly when you're 63. Um, and uh, the trail goes, it's approximately 3,000 miles, varies depending upon which alternates you take. Goes through uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, Yellowstone, and Glacier National Parks, and it goes to five states, which I'll get to in a second. Um, the unique thing about the CDT is that there's many alternates, about 15 or so in total, some of which are a couple of hundred miles along, others which are five or 10. Um, and I personally did about uh, 10 of them myself, which is why I only hiked 2,700 miles. Uh, if you were to um, hike from sea level up to the top of Everest 16 times, that's the amount of climbing you would have done to hike the entire CDT. Um, the highest point is in Colorado, naturally Gray's Peak, just a little over 14,000 feet. And the lowest point, anybody hiked in the White Mountains here? Um, <laughs> so you know that for a mountain to make the list of the official 4,000 footers, it's gotta be at least 4,000 feet tall. Well, the entire length of the CDT is over 4,000 feet. Um, and, and most of it is much higher than that. Um, the lowest point, Lordsburg, New Mexico, just down in the boot heel. And typically people take four to six months to hike the entire trail. It took me about four and a half. And also typically people go through the same number of pairs of shoes. I went through uh, four my, or no, five myself and every pair was completely shot by the time I was done with it. Um, to date, only about a thousand people have actually completed the trail. And if you compare that to the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest, about a thousand people complete each of those trails every year. So this trail is, is much more remote than the others. It's more difficult, navigation is tough. Um, and uh, so just not many people show up each year to, to try to hike it. So I'm gonna work my way up the right margin here just to talk about what the trail is like through each of the five states it goes through. So you start out in New Mexico, way down in the, the boot heel. Um, so that's uh, 777 miles up to the border of, of uh, Colorado. Uh, my impression of New Mexico is intense sun. Um, never a drop of rain the entire time going through that state. Um, it's very hot, incredibly windy, um, dry water is a real issue. And you start out around just above 4,000 feet in the boot heel, and you, by the time you get to Colorado, you're up about 11,000 feet. So you basically gradual climbing the entire way through the state, which is a good thing because it acclimates you to the high terrain, high elevation ahead through Colorado. Uh, Colorado, um, that's basically known for its very high elevation. Um, when you cross the border, you're at about 10,000, you immediately climb up to 12. You're um, above 10,000 for the first uh, 200 miles through Colorado. You never drop below 10,000 feet. Um, that's where you hit the high point, Gray's Peak at 14, and you're up above 13,000 feet 
you know, much of the time, you know, many, many days you're above 13,000 feet. Uh, the other unique or um, kind of characteristic thing about uh, Colorado is the afternoon thunderstorms. So you're not only at a high elevation, but every afternoon, you know, never fails. The, the clouds darken up at some point in the sky, and before you know it, you got you know thunder and lightning all around you. So you really have to make sure you're you're down off the ridge or the summits in the afternoon if if you can. So then. Um, Coming out of Colorado, you drop down, and the southern part of Wyoming is actually another desert, as most of New Mexico was. Uh, it's the Red Desert, which goes through an area called the Great Divide Basin, where the Continental Divide actually splits. So the divide is where water that flows from one side of the Atlantic, the other side of the Pacific. There's actually a point in the middle surrounded by the split where water goes in there never to come out again. It's just uh, that dry. Uh, the kind of the central part of Wyoming, north to south, that is, you go through a, a beautiful mountain range called the Wind River Range. Um, some of the most spectacular scenery in the entire trail, and certainly the most spectacular mosquitoes I have ever experienced. <laughs> uh, up in the northwest corner of the state, you go through Yellowstone before exiting off through the western border into Idaho. And in fact, um, the trail at this point actually follows the uh, Idaho, Montana border. So it basically it's left foot in Idaho, right foot in Montana for 300 miles. Um, eventually you take a right turn there um, and reach a town called Anaconda and then you take a, a, a left-hand turn and basically go due north up to the border of Canada. Finish off in Glacier National Park which is definitely one of the highlights of the, of the trip. So um, this trail, the CDT, is basically one of three trails that comprise the long distance uh, hiking triple crown. And I did the other two in previous years. In 2014, I did the AT and 2018, the, the Pacific Crest or the PCT. And so basically when I started out on, the, um, on April 21st last year, I was setting out not just to try to complete the CDT, but also to finish off the triple crown. So it actually took me three days to get from here to there, which is the southern terminus of the trail. First day I flew to Tucson. Second day I took a Greyhound east to Lordsburg, New Mexico. And the third day I took an 80-mile shuttle ride south uh, to the southern terminus. Um, and I have never had so much excitement plus nervousness when I first set eyes on this monument. Um, partly because the day before in, in taking that Greyhound to Lordsburg, um, I was just um, struck by just how inhospitable the, the scenery was. It was just nothing but cactus and you know, dead brush like this and no water anywhere in sight. It just it looked like a great place to, to go to die. <laughs> and so this is... Uh, you know, a few miles up the trail here, and you can see that, uh, see if I can get that mouse out of the way. You know, there's it's basically a lot of nothingness here. Um, so shade down in the southern part of New Mexico is like almost non-existent. Um, and uh, like I said, New Mexico, I was struck by just this intense sun all the time, and there's really no way to escape it. Although these, these two guys had, um, had their own idea. So some people carried um, a sun umbrella like Sputnik here, and this other guy was kind of carving out a little bit of shade in the side of a wash. This is basically a dry stream bed. Uh, when it rains, basically torrential rain at various points in the year in New Mexico, and this will be like a, a raging river, but you know, 10 months of the year, it's just completely dry. So one of the things that got me through the pandemic was just the vision of cowboy camping in New Mexico here. So this is my first night out. Just so happens that my, um, my sleeping bag here was pointed due north. So my feet were basically pointed directly at the North Star. So when the sun went down, I could see it was another star because I could see the Big Dipper pointing to it. And I woke up three or four times during the course of the night and I could just watch the Big Dipper revolving around the North Star. It was really an awesome experience. 
And when you spend, you know, four or five months out in the outside for, for so long, you really do get in tune with the, the cycle of the moon and the, the stars and, you know, just you're much more in tune with nature and, and what's going on up in the sky. Uh, the desert is also a great place to see sunsets and, and sunrises. Um, I tend to be a pretty early riser, so I had sunrises like this most, uh, most mornings along the, the CDT. So the, the first 85 miles from the, the start of the trail back to Lordsburg, the trail actually goes right through the town of Lordsburg, there's so little water there that um, the, the organization that actually maintains or manages the trail, the, the Continental Divide Trail Coalition, they actually set up these water caches, basically big metal boxes with five gallon jugs of water in them. And they make sure they, they keep, uh, you know, keep filling them as, as hikers go through. Um, without these, it'd be really hard to, to make your way along the CDT. And this is uh, one of my good friends who I hiked much of New Mexico with at the, the water cache there. His, his name's Brainstorm. So another thing that I learned pretty early on about the CDT, um, I learned from somebody who had already done it once, was th the saying that if, if you don't lose the trail at least once a day, you're not on the CDT. <laughs> and this, this slide kind of illustrates that fact. The trail just kind of branches off into a bunch of different directions and you just have to pick one and go with it. And I had an application that uh, I can use to navigate and you know, you get far enough out, you check, oh nope, I'm off the trail. But fortunately there's so little vegetation here, you can just go cross country to get back onto the, the correct trail. Uh, there's also a lot of private land in New Mexico, as there is most, in most of the states the trail goes through. So you're constantly going, you know, basically having to, the trail crosses the, you know, the land boundaries. And so here I am early morning, uh, kind of going underneath the, the barbed wire fence. Fortunately, the, the lowest uh, strand of wire here didn't have barbs on it. It wasn't always the case though. So once we got out of the boot heel and those water caches no longer existed, and so now we're basically sharing water such as this with the, the cattle that are out in the field. So plenty of protein here, as you can see, floating <laughs> on the surface. Um, uh, so I use a, uh, just a, uh, now I'm blanking on the name, a Sawyer filter. That, so yeah, I filter all of my water. And as a result, I, I never got sick. But uh, there are some people who refuse to filter. And you know, I think there's a, a pretty strong correlation between not filtering and getting sick. <laughs> so these are uh, what you would call hiker trash. <laughs> We, we wear that uh, moniker with pride. This is actually one of the first, uh, it's really kind of a third quote trail town along the way, Doc Campbell's post. So I, I sent myself a resupply box from home to here to, uh, to resupply. I typically resupply it every four or five days along the way. So that's, you know, 100, 100 miles or so. So one of the first major, or the first major alternate that I took was a 100 mile um, alternate called the uh, Gila River alternate. Basically followed this river canyon for 100 miles. And as you can see here, there's a you know, big cliff on the right. So every time the wall closes in on one side of the river, basically the trail crosses over to the other side. And you stay there for you know, maybe a mile, maybe a tenth of a mile. Um, and then you cross back over. And so, in all, over those 100 miles, I think I crossed this 240 times. So needless to say, in those three days, my feet were never dry. And so here's a typical crossing. Now, in our year, it was a relatively low snow year, and therefore the river wasn't all that high. It was, and it varied anywhere from like mid-calf to mid-thigh deep. Um, and except for places where beavers would build dams, and then upstream of that, you get maybe waist-deep crossings. Um, but these are uh, Clink, Mountain Goat, and Low Branch, three of the guys I hike with through, the, uh, through this particular... Uh, was there trout in there? What's that again? Was there trout in there? Um, not sure. I didn't actually see any fish as I was crossing through. So once we got 
out of that alternate and back on kind of dry land here, um, here you'll see one of the few fires that actually affected me along the way. Um, this, this road, this um, road we're walking along here, when we get into the woods up there, there was actually a, a fire that had just broken out a day or so before that, and there was actually an, an active fire with a crew working on it. And so they had us jump into the back of their pickup and shuttled us through this fire that was burning right along the side of the road. It was actually three miles of the trail that I didn't do because of that fire, but um, you know, I still consider myself to have done it. <laughs> so the next, or one of the next towns up the, the, um, the trail was called Pie Town, and this, uh, the, the hostel here is called the, uh, the Toaster House. Um, and the fellow to the left here in the black jacket, his name was Cutie, great guy, met him a couple of times along the trail. Tragically, uh, he was found dead in his tent in Colorado, up at high elevation. Never did find out what it was, but I assume it was, I don't know, something to do with the, you know, the 12,000 feet or so he was at. Yeah, so there's a section of like um, pretty rough terrain north of here that I'm assuming these are maybe from southbounders who've like discarded their shoes. Maybe they're people who quit and just, you know, tie their shoes up on the wall. Um, but uh, the tr shoes definitely do get destroyed on this trail, um, particularly going through the volcano fields. So Mexico, one of its attributes is a lot of road walking, such as this here. Very long, straight roads. And there just happened to be a pack of llamas uh, standing around the side of the road. So I thought this was an interesting photo to get, you know, one of the llamas plus the, you know, typical scenery in New Mexico where you've got, you know, these expansive views of 20, 30, 40 miles in all directions. So the, the trail at this point actually ran along a fairly major highway paved, and, but there was an alternate that ran up, up this, along the top of this mesa. So Myself and one of the guys I was hiking with at the time, um, uphill, we decided to hike the alternate along the mesa, slept up there the night uh, for the night, and then we came down the next morning and had the, uh, an awesome view of, of this arch, the Ventana Arch, um, coming down a, a pretty sketchy, steep uh, slope to, to get to this point. So I mentioned volcano fields. This is actually my friend uphill here. Um, these are, you know, basically rocks with all sorts of cracks and fissures and, you know, a lot of things to just ready to, to break your ankle if you're not careful with your steps. Turns out that uphill at this point, he'd actually broken his foot. Um, he was just trying to ward it off taking ibuprofen. Um, but eventually it got so painful that he hitched to Albuquerque. Um, got it, uh, an x-ray and he had basically a couple of breaks in his foot that he had to go home to Iowa and, and get operator on to fix it. So I, I stopped uh, in a town called Grants. Um, in fact, uh, a, a former neighbor, Lower, uh, Lower Falls neighbor, um, Jim Palmer, lives in Albuquerque. He came out to Grants to, uh, to have dinner with me, which is great. Um, the next day, uh, hiking north, I decided to go on another alternate up and over Mount Taylor. This is the highest I'd been to at that point, and I was sucking some serious wind up at 11,000 feet. It's also the first time I encountered snow and ice along the trail, the north side of the mountain. There was just a bit of that. Uh... And then a couple of days later, I'm walking on this plateau at about 8,000 feet. Um, the trail drops down into this canyon down to about six. Um, and this is one of the times where I had some, a serious water issue. So I had three liters, which generally would have been plenty to go the 14 miles to the next water um, source. Um, so I walked right by a potential you know, source of water a half mile or so off the trail. And boy, did I regret that you know, an hour or two later. Um, because down at 6,000 feet, um, it was much hotter. There was no wind because of the, the walls of the canyon. And um, I was suffering mightily the last six or so miles. I was actually having to uh, ration my water to make it the last little bit to this water cache here. Um, 
And when I, when I got to this thing, I just like took a gallon of water and just gulped it down in like two minutes. I was just, just about to succumb to, to dehydration. It's not a, not a fun way to go. I don't recommend it. And then a day later, you get up to 10,000 feet here and the, uh, you know, the, the scenery changes completely. All of a sudden, you're out of the desert. You've got these beautiful tall pine trees, you know, walking on pine needles. Um, and a day after this, I'm walking through snow. This is up at about 11,000 feet. Not only was there snow, but there was like entire fields that were just completely filled with water. And I'm you know, hiking up to my, my knees in you know, foot deep water. So, despite what you might think, this is not a green smoothie. <laughs> um, so when I showed up here, um, myself and these two other people had this, this, this uh, water source to ourselves, and then these cows decided to show up, and they were none too happy that uh, these hikers had invaded their water source. But I had just managed to filter a couple liters before I, I took off, and the, kind of the cows gave us the boot. So you, you might think that, you know, when you're hiking 20, 30 miles a day, might be, you know, five days since you last showered, um, you know, you're completely dirty, smelly, tired. You might think that you'd be really unhappy in those circumstances, but I think this picture actually kind of captures the, the typical feeling of a through hiker, which is, you know, the simplicity of life, the adventure, um, people are generally in great spirits along the trail. And uh, I was actually in particularly good spirits at this point because I just found out that my daughter had been accepted to medical school. So it was one of the highlights of my trip. Uh, my, my nephew John, his wife Teresa, and their kids Sam and Hannah, uh, they, uh, he's actually a physicist at the Los Alamos, uh, um, whatever, uh, lab an hour or so south of, uh, of Ghost Ranch here. They came up and, and visited me, um, and so we had a nice dinner together. Uh, this is also around the time that I found out that there were a couple of fires in northern Arizona which were threatening to close the CDT. And at this point I found out that I had basically like two and a half days to cover 80 or so miles to the border of Colorado before the CDT was going to be closed down. So um, I really had to, to make tracks to try to get there before the, the trail closed. Um, this is some of the scenery I, I, I saw along the way. Probably one of the most beautiful places I saw in New Mexico was walking along the edge of this cliff and then a thousand feet down to our left was uh, this beautiful river and the walking in, you know, late in the day towards the sun. Um, it was you know, one of my favorite uh, pictures of the entire trip. And uh, so um, on exactly 30 days after I started, I made it through um, New Mexico, got to the Colorado border. And you might think that, well, you know, I've just hiked over 700 miles, you know, there should be neon lights and uh, <laughs> whatever. Um, that's not what you get on the CDT. The, the CDT really has a, the ability to put you in, in your place. It's a very, you know, no frills type of trail. You see here the sign is like, almost toppled over. There's a couple of beat up license plates marking the border. Um, but uh, I felt a lot of pride in getting to this point anyway. It was, uh, it was a, a pretty big thrill to, to make it here. But as, uh, as proud as I felt, um, this family of seven here, um, the Nettebergs, the, the two parents are actually uh, medical doctors, um, missionary medical doctors in Chad. And they, with their five kids, were actually hiking the CDT. Um, and uh, it was just, the, the oldest kid here is 12 on the left. His name is Blaze. Father's name was uh, Lion King, um, Boomerang in the Green. Um, let's see, with the angel wings in the yellow. The mother's is Queen Bee. The youngest there in the mother's arms, she, had, she was still under one year old, not completely toilet trained, didn't walk, so her name was Dead Weight. <laughs> and 
<laughs> the one in the black here is actually the youngest person ever to have hiked the Appalachian Trail. She did that at four years old. So her name was the Beast. <laughs> and I actually had the pleasure, they, they were actually, the way they were doing it is, um, they actually got caught by the, the forest fire closure of the CDT, so they had to road walk around it, I don't know, 80, 100 miles. So they actually asked me to drive their minivan with the seven of them, like 17 miles south of the, tri the town I was in here. They got out, road walked along this, this highway, this, seven of them, and I drove their van back to town for them and left it there. So they're a pretty, pretty inspirational family. I actually met them. They, they were jumping around a little bit, but I met them in, back in Glacier National Park when I was just about done, and they had skipped a few sections, but they were, they were just finishing off the, the northern section of the trail. So once you cross into Colorado, you immediately go up to 12,000 feet. You get into the first major mountain range in Colorado called the San Juans. Um, they got some snow here. Uh, this particular day, it was extremely windy. It was getting rained on and so forth. Um, and then the next morning, we made camp here by this lake and set up the tents and bare ground. The next morning, we had you know, four or five inches of snow on the ground. And this is the first time I had to use my stove, which I normally use to, to cook my food with, to actually thaw out my socks and shoes so I could get them on the next morning. <laughs> So I've done a fair amount of hiking in the White Mountains in the winter. Um, and this is about, is, it reminded me a lot of those experiences up in New Hampshire. Um, so for, I don't know, the first week or so, we were having storms come through, dump a, a lot of snow on the ground. So we were basically, you know, hiking through Colorado here in a lot of snow. There's a lot of snow travel, especially in southern Colorado. But the, the scenery made it all worthwhile. Just some of the, you know, some of the mountains and you know, every time you turn around a corner, you see this amazing view. It, it really was, was quite spectacular, one of my favorite parts of the, the CDT. And one of my favorite campsites were basically surrounded by these snow-covered mountains. And I was able to set my tent up here behind this tree to get some shelter from the wind. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just, you know, pretty, pretty awesome hiking in the, the San Juans. There's also a lot of fairly steep snow traverses in Colorado. Um, and this, this is an example of one. So you, you know, you really don't want to slip and you go, you can go for a pretty long slide at various points along the way. Um, so um, the second trail town I went into in, um, in Colorado is called Pagosa Springs. And through a friend I'd met on the Appalachian Trail, I um, was given um, the contact of the woman third uh, in the blue jacket there, uh, Isabel. And she and her partner, um, Dan, basically invited me and this whole group to dinner at their house. And then on a Sunday, early on a Sunday morning, they drove us back to the trail, which is like 30 miles. Um, and here they are dropping us off at Wolf, Wolf Creek Pass so we could you know, get going on the trail. Uh, early on a Sunday morning, pretty amazing. And that, that's what we call trail magic, where people just go out of their way to do really kind things for, for hikers. Uh, just some more scenery of uh, some of the snow travel we had. Uh, the woman there, um, Gables, was like making her way down the snow slope and I just basically got to the top and sat down and just slid down. It's called <laughs> glissading, which is a really fun and, and quick way to, to make your way down steep terrain. Um, one of the few times I actually had to like wear all of my clothes because um, during the day the sun comes out and it's normally pretty warm, but I think this day it was just cold and very windy. So I was basically bundled up with, you know, down jacket and long pants and everything else. This, this may have been one of the most treacherous uh, snow traverses. There's actually a series of like six or eight um, snow crossings like this. And um, here I am hiking with a, a woman I hike with through the San Juans named Band-Aid. Um, I think she got my name because she's a school nurse and so that was her <laughs> primary activity. Um, but we went through here about 8.30 a.m. so the snow was still frozen from the night before and 
one slip here and you were going to go down a thousand feet and crash in the rocks at the bottom. So, you know, we made extra care, we're extra careful that we didn't actually slip crossing this snowfield. And here, are my tent on the left and band-aids on the right were camped up above 12,000 feet with a couple of 14ers uh, just to the south of us. So we had to um, get down from the high elevation to resupply in a town called Silver Silverton, straight out of a Western movie set here. Um, and uh, basically, it's an old mining town, so there's a lot of silver mines in the area. So the, the uh, CDT and the Colorado Trail are actually coincident for about 300 miles. And some of the best tread, you know, basically walking um, area on the, the entire CDT because the, the Colorado Trail is so well maintained. There's a, like an army of people who maintain that trail. Um, so this is the high point of the Colorado Trail, but not of the CDT at 13, a little over 13,000 feet. So, and it, you know, people ask you, well, what do you think about between, you know, when you're walking along? And this, this is basically what you think about, like a great percentage of the time is what, you know, when's your next meal going to be? What are you going to eat? Um, so this is a resupply uh, from uh, Lake City. Uh, I think I was planning for five days to the next town of Salida. Um, this actually only lasted four days, but fortunately I'd made it to Salida by then. Um, just you're burning maybe five, 6,000 calories a day. You just cannot get enough food in your system. And, um, you know, so a, a great way to, to lose weight is to do a through hike. I lost 20 pounds myself, and you can basically eat all you want and still not, not stay ahead of the calorie deficit. So here we are. We've just made out of the San Juans. We're looking back south towards the San Juans. And, you know, there's a couple of flat parts in Colorado, but they're pretty far and uh, are few and far between here. That's Band-Aid off in the distance. So this is a typical afternoon in Colorado. The skies have darkened, the lightning is threatening, um, and you really want to be off the ridges and particularly off the peaks because it, you know, people get people get killed by lightning all the time in Colorado. Uh, in Salida, I stayed at this uh, this hostel here, which is basically a guy turned his garage into uh, into a hostel where you know you could put down your your sleeping bag and and whatever mattress and uh, stay at his place for uh, 20 bucks or whatever. Um, the nice thing about this particular hostel was that he actually had beer on tap. <laughs> so here we are, you know, I think it's like mid-June or so. And the lakes, as you can see, a thousand feet below me here, many of the lakes are still frozen. So, um, and you know, 2022 was not a particularly high snow year, um, but there's still, you know, still a lot of snow and ice around. So probably my most fun 20 seconds on the CDT was coming down Lake Ann Pass. So I'm actually on my way down here. And you can see up at the top, there, that kind of lip of snow, that's called a cornice. Um, and so when I got to you know, hiking up the south side, got to the top there, and I, there was a guy in front of me named Cheese, Cheesy Turtle. Um, and uh, Cheesy, because he's from Wisconsin. Uh, he, was, he was back climbing down this almost vertical slope here. So he had his basically uh, micro spikes on his feet. He had his ice axe, and he's, he's walking face into the slope backwards, you know, very carefully going down. And I had been told that you could actually glissade down the slope and I was just, I just didn't, well, first of all, I didn't have an ice axe, but second of all, I thought it would be, you know, a great adventure to try sliding down this. So I basically got just, just to the left of that cornice, just sat down and just went. And the, the time it took, it, it maybe took Cheesy Turtle 15 minutes to go, I don't know, whatever, couple hundred yards, it took me 20 seconds. It was just <laughs> amazing. Um, and fortunately, the, the slope kind of got a little more gradual as I got down to that, that rock band there. Um, 
And because it was late in the, or mid afternoon, the sun was shining, the snow was kind of soft, and I was able to use my heels to control my speed. So here's uh, two of the friends. Um, in the middle is Low Branch. He actually had an accident where he slid down a snowfield, hit a tree, and broke his leg. Um, and uh, then um, uphill on the right, he was the guy who broke his foot in New Mexico. He went home, had it operated on, and came back, and he was doing trail magic along the way. And I was uh, the beneficiary of his trail magic for like four or five days, where you know, I'd come out of the woods, and there he'd be with his pickup truck with uh, you know, beer, soda, uh, subs, whatever. It was really uh, very generous of him to to do that. I think he, he liked just being around through hikers as well. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Uh, the Grove Vaspins, um, just, I love this picture, uh, the way the trail just kind of threads its way through there. Uh, so the highest mountain um, in Colorado, um, it's uh, called Mount Elbert. It's uh, like 14.4 change. Um, it's not right on the CDT, but it was only about a 10 mile round trip. So I figured, you know, when's the next time I'm gonna be able to climb the highest mountain? It's actually the second highest mountain in the lower 48 as well. So um, anyway, I took that side trip and it was well worth it here. You feel like you're on top of the world up at, at 14,000. That's a marmot there. Um, this guy was obviously, um, Fed, had been fed by other hikers because he would like walk right up to me and if I turned my head he'd like be you know attacking my pack looking for food and you're not really supposed to feed them because you want animals to stay wild but uh, anyway he was he was pretty uh, well trained to seek food from hikers so this is the top of the Breckenridge ski area we're about 500 feet above that that the CDT um, so got up to the top of Breck and I actually um, had a couple of friends, uh, Vicky on the left here, a trail angel I met on the AT back in 2014, kept in touch with her. Uh, since then, uh, when I knew I was gonna do the CDT, I sent her my proposed schedule for this. She, she and her husband Howard ended, ended up uh, renting a condo in Breckenridge, and uh, I happened to be going through there right at the time that I thought it would be. So I got off trail um, and stayed with her for two days along with uh, Brain here in the light blue jacket. He, he and I were hiking together at the time. So we basically spent two nights in, in Vicki and Howard's <coughs> condo, which is awesome. And then um, I spent <laughs> another two nights with my son Anders he, in the middle here um, in Vail. He was actually a golf pro uh, last year in Vail. So, uh, so basically I spent two nights with him and then we went out um, for a hike north of, of Breckenridge and uh, my brother Andy, who was hiking the Colorado Trail southbound, we basically set it up so that we would uh, intersect and then we hiked back to Breckenridge, went out and grabbed a beer and then Anders drove me back to the trail and I proceeded northbound and Andy proceeded southbound. So it was, it was awesome to, to meet both my brother and Anders uh, all at the same time. And Andy, by the way, is out on the, the Pacific Crest Trail right now. Uh, so that is Gray's Peak behind me. And I'm actually in a, tr a mountain called Mount Edwards. So I'm ab about 13.8. Uh, Gray's Peak's about 14.3. So it's only 500 feet to the top here. The, the hard part, though, is you've got this, this knife edge between Mount Edwards and Gray's Peak. Now, this you can't really see that knife edge very well from here, but this view um, gives a better view. This is just after I got over Gray's. So if you look directly up from that mountain goat there, that's Mount Edwards. And then the knife edge comes down to the right there. So basically, that's an area that's like literally knife edge. If you go over on the right, forget about it, you're dead. If you go on the left, you probably break a few bones, but you know, you probably survive. So that was one of the most, probably the most scariest parts of the entire trail for me. Um, I was rewarded with this campsite that, that night. This is actually the highest I ever camped on the CDT. It was about 12,700. Um, I, I was hiking um, until 
after sunset this night, um, found a flat spot, set up my tent, cooked dinner, just finished, and all of a sudden the wind picked up to the point where I literally thought I was going to be blown off the mountain. Um, I was really worried my tent was going to get blown apart. Um, fortunately, it wasn't. It survived. And the next morning I had this sunrise here and some absolutely gorgeous ridge walking uh, the next morning. Uh, this is the top of James Peak. Um, it's the last time the CDT goes above 13,000 feet. I got up to the top of this. Um, it, there's a, essentially a blizzard going on. I get a bit disoriented, started down the, what I realized was the wrong side of the mountain. Um, fortunately, I you know, realized that after only maybe a tenth of a mile. So I went back up to the top and found my, my way down the correct side of the mountain. And then this was my campsite um, about an hour later. The, the storm had cleared out, and I had a beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful night that night. Just camped right next to the CDT there. So two of my friends from the Appalachian Trail, we actually had hiked together in 2014 from the southern terminus up to the, the Smoky Mountains. On the left is Kim Possible in, in the middle of Sparkle. Um, and Kim Possible had rented out a condo in uh, Winter Park that I stayed at one night. And then they were following me along the trail and here they're giving trail magic to not just me, but anybody who happened to hike through there. Um, Kim Possible was not only responsible for this trail magic, she was also the one who set me up with Isabel um, in, uh, in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And then she also set me up with a friend of hers in Jackson, Wyoming, that uh, turned out to be incredibly beneficial for me uh, when I got off trail for a week to go to uh, Sonia's uh, white coat ceremony. So um, anyway, I was very appreciative of all Kim Possible did for me. So here I'm going through the Rocky Mountain National Park, or just the edge of it. And that, you may know, that burned a couple of years ago. And this is what it looks like you know, a couple of years after a major burn in a, you know, a forest. Um, things regenerate fairly quickly, but you can still see there's a lot of you know, dead uh, cinder trees in the area. So. Um, this mountain park view this is actually the last time you get up to 12,000 feet on the CDT. I got up to the top of this mountain late in the afternoon, just as the skies were darkening. Um, and on the way down the ridge, so I got, went up to the, you can see this little building on the top of the mountain, and then the trail takes a right down that ridge there. As about halfway down the ridge, thunder comes out, starts raining, and I'm on a ridge here, so that's like the highest point. So I ended up getting off the ridge, climbing down, you know, one or two hundred vertical feet below the ridge line, so I don't get struck, and you know kept hiking parallel to the ridge, but below it um, for the next hour or so until the storm cleared out. So uh, yeah, this is um, another one of my uh, um, little scary moments. Uh, I was walking along a snowbank that was covering the trail and. I'd done something I'd done a million times, which is basically jump off the snowbank down onto the ground. And I, would, I used my poles to like cushion my, my fall, but I planted my left pole right where my left foot wanted to go. That tripped me. I catapulted forward, face plant right into the ground, and unfortunately there was a rock right there. I was all alone a couple of days out of uh, Steamboat Springs, and you know I felt my head, I could feel blood. Fortunately, it wasn't bleeding any worse than many of my basketball injuries. So I <laughs> knew I was going to be all right. But uh, and it was a little scary to be injured you know, out in the middle of the wilderness. All right, so finally, on July 4th of all days, I made it out of Colorado. I can't think of a better way to celebrate the 4th. Um, I happened to be hiking here with this woman named Old Soul. Um, and uh, once again, you know, it's n no. Uh, no, whatever, uh, it's basically pretty low key border crossing. The Wyoming license plate was still in the tree. The Colorado one had, had fallen off, um, but I was pretty happy to, to be in a new state anyway. So um, the transition from Colorado where you're up in the mountains um, to uh, 
to basically the prairie and then to the desert is incredibly abrupt. So basically at this point where this picture was taken, I just walked out of the woods through this beautiful uh, field with flowers and everything. Um, and uh, the, the next thing you know, you're out of the mountains. There's like no trees anymore. And uh, you know, grassland like this. And then you know, a day or two of, of scenery like this and pretty soon you're in the red desert going across uh, through the Great Divide Basin in, uh, in southern Wyoming. So there's four days of scenery, very much like this. Um, fairly flat, but really hot, really dry, very little water. Um, thankfully, there were, you know, um, there's this water cache here. There was also a couple of cattle troughs and so forth. But, uh, you know, this was, this was a, a time of the hike where people were like doing really big mileage as I was just to try to get through the, uh, the really dry terrain of, of uh, southern Wyoming. And then off in the distance, I've just about made it through the Great Divide Basin here and there, there you can see the Wind River Range off in the distance, the, the next mountain range in kind of central Wyoming. But before I got up into, the, um, into that mountain range, I stopped in a little town called Atlantic City um, not to be confused with the one in New Jersey. And uh, this was Wild Bill. He ran a B&B &B slash gun shop. Um, it, was a real, uh, it was a real change of scenery between, you know, coming from Massachusetts and being out west where, you know, guns are just everywhere. People have them on their, you know, their waist right out in sight. Um, he actually turned out to be a really nice guy. He, when I was there, he actually went out and rescued some people out of the Great Divide Basin who were having some problems. But, uh, you know, he didn't really want to mess with this guy. But the next day, I was back in, you know, beautiful mountainous scenery with all the water you can imagine. That, that's one of the things about the CDT is you go from, like, no water whatsoever to, like, more water than you can possibly imagine. Um, not only water, but also animals. Uh, this moose here was maybe 10 yards off the trail. I walked by, he, didn't, he seemed totally nonplussed with my presence. Took a couple of pictures. He might have taken one step back and I was able to take some pictures and then keep hiking. Uh, another, um, another alternate I took through uh, the Wind River Range was called the, uh, the Cirque of the Towers. Um, these magnificent mountains, you know, up towards the sky and, uh, you know, alpine lakes. You can see here that, I mean, we're well into July here. There's still ice in the lake um, and uh, just some fantastic scenery. So one of the nicer sunrise pictures I had is actually called Lonesome Lake, but it's not the Lonesome Lake you might know up in New Hampshire. Uh, the, the CDT is not only a hiking trail, it also allows for horse travel. And you can see this guy in his, his, his waist there, he's got a gun. Um, yeah, guns are pretty, pretty prevalent out west. <coughs> so I actually met up with this group in the Wind River Range. I needed a resupply, and uh, there's about a 12-mile side trip I had to make to get down to Pinedale. But the, the side trail didn't take me to the town itself. It took me to a parking lot, and it was another 15 miles or so to town. And this group here, they, they actually uh, offered to give me a ride to town. And not only that, but they also bought me lunch, which might have been a mistake on their part, because I had <laughs> serious hiker hunger. Um, but it was really fun driving down to town with this, this, or some of the members of this group. The kids were peppering me with all sorts of questions. It's really fun. I, I think that you know, a couple of these kids may end up doing a through hike themselves one day. So back into the Wind River Range here. Some unbelievable scenery. All the water you can imagine. And plenty of snow as well. Um, the, the, the trail you can see here goes up this snow bank on the left of the river, but prior to getting to this point, the, the trail had actually crossed this river two or three times, so my feet were completely wet anyway, so it wouldn't even have mattered if I'd slid into the river again. 
and getting to the end of the Wind River Range and this will, the, the last trail that, that basically goes down the valley and, and exits the, the range and this is looking back to the, to the south at what had just come down here. So another very abrupt transition from the mountains to the prairie again. So at this point, we're getting pretty close to the, the northwest of, of Wyoming in, in Yellowstone Park. I think in another day or two, I got there. But before that, I uh, made another um, stop in Du Bois, uh, Wyoming. And actually, there's a, like a 30-mile hitch to get into town. And um, I ended up getting hitched in an 18-wheeler. It was a pretty awesome <laughs> experience. Uh, so this, this local church here, Church of Christ, actually um, would put up through hikers but um, there happened to be, the, the night I was there, there was a convergence of, of, I don't know, six or eight through hikers with a, a group of about 20 bicyclists who were, who were bicycling uh, east to west across the country. So basically we completely filled up this, this room here with, uh, with hikers and bikers. So one of the guys I met at that church, his name was um, Mummy. Mummy, because when he was on the PCT a couple of years ago, he had so many bandages all over his legs that uh, people thought he looked like a mummy. Um, but here he's, uh, here he's crossing or fording a river um, called the, uh, what's this called? Yeah, the, the North Buffalo Fork. Uh, this is maybe, you can see here, maybe knee deep. Um, there, you know, aside from those 200 or so river crossings way back in New Mexico, there's another, I don't know, 100 river crossings uh, just like this uh, north of that. Um, but none were quite as bad as some of the ones I did on the Pacific Crest Trail four years earlier. There's the Snake River. And so at this point, I've, I've come into uh, Yellowstone National Park. Um, and in Yellowstone, I came to this uh, Heart Lake. Um, I was all alone at this point, had this entire lake to myself. I was completely grungy. So I basically decided to strip down, go for a skinny dip in this lake. And I got back onto the beach, put my clothes on. And I realized my clothes are now much dirtier than I am. So I jumped in again, fully clothed, <laughs> to try to get them clean. So in Yellowstone, you go through lots of uh, you know, bubbling pools like this with interesting colors and, you know, uh, smells of, of sulfur. And this lasted for a few days. Um, and uh, this, uh, this is one of the geysers um, in Yellowstone. It's called Lone Star Geyser. Um, and in fact, Mummy and I, our, our assigned campground was only about a mile from this. So we actually sat here for an hour or so eating dinner and watching this thing erupt over and over again. Some more pools we walked along in Yellowstone. All right, so this is another woman I'd never met before. Uh, she lives in Jackson, Wyoming, and she's one of the best friends of Kim Possible, that friend from the AT. And so um, I needed to get from the trail in Yellowstone um, out to Michigan to go to a ceremony for Sonia. And so she, she put me up for two nights on my way to Michigan. And the day in between, she lent me her car so I could drive to Idaho two hours to get a, a root canal. Um, <laughs> and then I, I flew to Michigan, went to Sony ceremony, came back, and she had left her car for me at the airport to drive back to her house. And then I, I hitched uh, back, to, back to the trail. It was actually an 80-mile hitch. was pretty interesting. But, uh, you know, it's incredible trail magic that, uh, that Sarah gave me. That's her boyfriend, Jimmy. So this is uh, Sonia at her white coat ceremony, boyfriend Jack on the left, my wife Tor in the middle there, and myself on the far right. So unfortunately, I had to get back on the trail. Um, this is probably the best uh, state boundary that I encountered. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's a nice Jack Daniels ball there. I took a, a swig of that to celebrate a new state. Um, it's one of the, the most beautiful um, 
sections of trail that I remember hiking on through this field of flowers. Um, up in front is Mishap, and the guy in the middle, his name is Cash. Hike with them for a couple of days through here. And so this is kind of what a lot of the scenery through that Idaho, Montana border section look like. So you got these like ridges that the trail progress along and basically the border of the two states runs along the top of the ridge. So again, it's like left foot Idaho, right foot Montana for several hundred miles. And if you ever wonder why Montana is called the Big Sky State, this, this picture you know, tries to capture that. Just the, the, the views are, are magnificent and it looks, you know, they go on forever. So the guy in the left here, his name is Snurgle. He's a 28 year old from England. And he and I had hiked together a bit in New Mexico and Southern Colorado. Uh, he got way ahead of me, but he got off for three weeks to, to spend some time with his girlfriend. I got off for a week. Um, and um, so when we got back on, we pretty much got back on the same point. And so we met up in, in Ledore, Idaho here, and we ended up hiking the entire rest of the trip together. Um, he was a much stronger hiker than I am at 28, not surprising. Um, but he told me pretty early on that he wanted, he wanted to hike 30 miles every day on days we weren't going into or out of a, a trail town. Um, so I took that as a challenge, and, um, but it was, it was, a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty tough going trying to keep up with him for that long. Um, the, the way we actually work things is he, you know, 28-year-old, he would sleep a lot more than I would. So I'd get up at 5. The last thing I'd do walking out of camp was to knock on his tent to wake him up. And uh, so he'd, I'd be an hour ahead of him when I left. He'd pr catch me usually like late morning, pass me. And then an hour later, I'd pass him because he was like taking a nap on the side of the trail. And we'd kind of <laughs> do that for the rest of the day. And we'd end up at the, you know, the campground at night pretty much the same time each day. Um, but another funny story about him is, you know, he knew, he knew he was a lot stronger than I was. I knew it as well. Um, but uh, one day, he, he, he had looked at the map ahead and said, oh, you know, it's 30, 30 miles, we've got six passes to climb. It's 8,000 vertical feet. You know, we're, we're just not going to be able to do it. We're going to have to do 25 miles instead. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so I went to bed, you know, with that thought in my head. And I woke up the next morning and said, no way, we're doing 30. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think it was the next day, maybe going up the fourth or fifth pass, when I realized that, you know what, Snurgle was actually using psychology against me. <laughs> um, and so I asked him about it the, a day or so later, and he said, yep, that's what it was. It was reverse psychology. Basically, it was, he was implying that I wasn't able to keep up with him. And we did manage to do 30 that day, but I didn't get into camp till like 9 p.m. when it was getting dark. So um, this is Lemmy Pass. This is where, um, uh, what's, uh, yeah, so Lewis and Clark went through here in 1805. Um, one of the nicer campgrounds that I stayed at. Uh, some more you know, random tree scenery here. In, in, uh, at this point, we're in Montana. Uh, towards the end of the hike there, there's a lot of beautiful alpine lakes. So I tended to find myself in one or two of them each day uh, for the last few weeks of the trip. Uh, this is Anaconda, uh, Montana. And I thought it was kind of cute to see this, uh, the mother deer and her two does following her through the center of town. Um, yeah, more typical scenery in kind of the, the, the Montana area now of the trail. So a lot of kind of grassy, ridge walking type of scenery. All right, so now we're in the Bob Marshall Wilderness. That's Snurgle on the right. Um, and there's the, this is called the Chinese wall. It's basically what they call an escarpment. It's, it's this, this wall that goes about 12 miles, about 1,000 feet from bottom to top. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite spectacular. Uh, we had just, despite the smiles, we had just gotten totally pelted with a, a thunder and lightning storm, got totally soaked. Um, but it, you know, 
10 minutes later, the, the storm blew off and we had blue skies behind us. So one of the, uh, one of the worst things about the, the CDT was the constant blowdowns we had to go through. So um, there's a, a typical place where you have to go you know, over some trees, under others, around others. Um, and I happened to you know, be really frustrated because this was going to be a town day. We wanted to get into town um, and we you know, had 25 miles or so to cover and this, this blowdown was slowing us down here. Um, so I, at this point I had like gone off the side to get around this you know, large set of blown down trees and there happened to be a day hiker coming the other way and he heard me like rustling in bushes off in the distance. He goes, did you lose the trail? And I was like so frustrated at that point and it wasn't his fault at all and I said, no, I'm trying to get around this effing blowdown. Um, anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> but you can see here this, this, this tree that's lying across the trail here with all these branches sticking out. If you're trying to climb over that and you slip and fall, you get impaled and you could easily bleed out. Um, so it, it's not only is it frustrating, but it's actually quite dangerous. And so the very last section of the hike is through Glacier, Glacier National Park. Um, if it's not on your bucket list, it really should be. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's like one of the three most beautiful places I've been to on this earth. Uh, and that includes like the Grand Canyon and um, the, the west coast of Norway where the, the fjord land is. Um, had some awesome weather going through here, you know, 70 degrees, sunny each day. Um, and, you know, basically glacier just filled with these, these high mountains, that have been carved out by glaciers over the millennia with alpine lakes. Um, and um, so one of the passes we went over in Glacier called Triple Divide Pass. So this mountain behind me called Triple Divide Peak separates three watersheds. So to the left is the Atlantic, to the right is the Arctic, and then behind the peak is the Pacific. So water that drops there will go to one of three watersheds depending on what side of this peak it drops on. Just more scenery of the, you know, the trail going through a glacier. You can see the trail running way down, you know, a thousand feet below where this picture was taken from. One of the most beautiful places on earth. This is called Many Glacier. There's a hotel there. It looks out and you can see glaciers in all directions. Uh, one of the, probably the most dramatic pass that we went over and you know, every day through Glacier, we'd be hiking up, up and over one or two passes. Uh, this is called Swift Current Pass. It reminded me a little bit of a, of like uh, Tuckerman's Ravine on Mount Washington. So the trail kind of got, came up towards this head wall and I'm thinking to myself, how is this trail possibly gonna get up and over this head wall? Well, it turns out the trail took a sharp right turn and went along some impossibly steep drop offs where I didn't even want to look over the edge. It was you know, so scary and I really would not have wanted to hike through here in the winter when there was snow on the ground. Uh, this, this act, these two pictures are actually taken from the same spot, this one looking west and this one looking back east. And through the, the valley there, if you go far enough in that direction, you'll get to the, the plains of, uh, of northern Montana. Uh, this is the last day on the trail. And this is the very last pass we had to climb going um, up towards the Canadian border. This is going up. Uh, the guy in front of me there is karaoke. We hiked for the last four days or so together. And then going down that same pass, getting pretty close to the, uh, the border of Canada. And there we are in Canada. So that's Snurgle, karaoke, um, leftovers, the guy um, in the blue shirt, and then myself. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that was it. Uh, it's pretty, pretty relieved, pretty excited to get to the border. Um, I was actually in a bit of a, a pain. I uh, did something, well, had bone on bone going to my hip for uh, quite a ways and did a lot of ibuprofen. And I think the endorphins kind of kept the, the pain at bay, but I ended up um, getting a hip replacement in January as a result of, uh, of you know, basically wearing out my hip. I think this, this final hike just you know, did the trick. So just a few uh, numbers and statistics here. So 
Started April 21st, finished September 2nd. So it was 135 days, uh, 15 of which were zero days, no, no distance on the, the CDT. So just under 2,700 miles, approximately 6 million steps. Um, I went through five pairs of shoes and I really went through them completely. I'm averaged almost exactly 20 miles a day and 22.5 if you discount the uh, zero days. Uh, my longest day was in the Great Divide Basin, just over 40 miles. Um, spent 82 nights in my tent, 20 nights mostly in New Mexico cowboy camped. Um, the highest campsite was at night. My tent almost blew away at 12,700. Uh, I estimate, you know, just short of a million calories burned. And with that, I lost 20 pounds. Were there issues with animals? Uh, how does it work? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the worst animals I encountered actually were mosquitoes. Um, I mean, they were, so I carried bear spray like once I got into Wyoming for the grizzly bears, but I never actually encountered any grizzlies. I saw probably half a dozen black bears, but thankfully no grizzlies. I, well, how about in the New Mexico, like snakes and some others? Yeah. yeah, I only saw one rattlesnake. It surprised me a bit. Um, I saw many more than that along the PCT. But, uh, I mean, there were lizards in the desert and things like that. But um, not during the night like you were. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, animals weren't really too much of a problem for me. The main thing that was really shocking about the private land and crossing into the Franklin, so they made the trail purposely to go into a private land. Like, yeah. Legally, is that allowed? I'm not sure what took place in terms of the negotiations to allow the trail to go through these private lands, but um, you know, whatever, however they managed to do it, they, they did it. They, the CDTC is trying to acquire enough land so that it doesn't need to cross private lands. But by design, CDT needs to go under these barbed wires. In a lot of places, they've built um, gates that you can pass through, but I probably crawled under, I don't know, a couple of dozen fences like that. So was it originally a bath of Native Americans that initially was I mean, the, the land itself was all you know, populated by Native Americans. Um, and I, I don't know the details in terms of like which tribes occupied which areas, but yeah, th it is all originally native land. Yes. What inspired you to do this? <laughs> Why do you do it? Uh, What's next? Yeah, well, when I, shortly after I got a, a college, I had a, a housemate who had done the Appalachian Trail. So that, that kind of gave me the, the initial seed of of wanting to do that. So I did that in 2014, you know, after my kids were old enough that my wife wouldn't go totally crazy for me being, long, me being gone for so long. Um, and um, after I got home, I, maybe it took a month to really recover from the AT, and then I, I realized, you know, I, you actually feel a little bit of grief, you know, missing the camaraderie and the simplicity and everything else about a through hike. So um, I gave my wife a heads up that four years later I was going to do the PCT and that kind of the same thing happened with the CDT as well. Um, what's, what's next? Well, probably no real through hikes, long distance through hikes like this, but my wife and I would like to do the uh, coast to coast in England, which is, you know, relatively short, you know, 200 mile trail east to west across England and also the uh, the one in Spain, um, the, the Camino. Oh. Yeah. Those are gonna feel like a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> Something can be said for like sleeping in a you know motel every night and you know, having a the company of, of joy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I have a question about um, so you were obviously hiking with people a fair amount of the time. Yep. How much of it? What percentage do you think you were on just by yourself with nobody else around? So. Yeah, I actually uh, went through, and I think about 30% of the time I camped alone. Yeah. Probably 
80 or 90 percent of the time, I was actually walking alone along the trail. Ah, uh, even if somebody was ahead of you or behind yeah. you, you were on your own. Yeah, because yeah. it's really hard to match somebody else's pace. Um, and uh, yeah, I just liked, I mean, most through hikers, especially on the CDT, are, they, they don't mind being alone. They're yeah. But then you love the camaraderie too. Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So typically on one of these long distance trails, about a quarter of the people who start actually finish. So um, this this year on or 2022 on the, the CDT, it was estimated about 800, 800 people started. And about 160 have actually, um, whatever, uh, signed up for the at the website that indicates that they finished. So about you know one in four or so. Um, so yeah, it's you know, whatever people get injured, they run out of money, they just find they don't like you know, hiking, you know, going with a week without a shower, whatever. Um, it's it's definitely not for everybody. <coughs> Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning about like the connection that you create that you had, like seeing stars every night. Yep. And like we don't get at all yeah. in the suburbs. Can you talk more about that? And just like I'm sure you missed that, like seeing the stars every night. Like uh, yeah, I mean that's one of the reasons I liked cowboy camping is you know you lying down and you open your eyes and you can just see the the stars you know above you, um, and you also get really in tune with. Um, you know, the, the phase of the moon, you know, you get, start to get used to the fact, oh yeah, it's, you know, full moon now, because it, you know, there's so much light at night. Um, um, yeah, there, there, there's something really, um, you know, primitive about just living that lifestyle where you're so close to nature and so, so close to the sky and the stars. Um, it, I don't know, when I got back from the AT, I thought everybody should, Everybody would love to do a through hike. It's just the, the greatest thing in the world. And it took me literally four years after I'd done the PC to realize that no, through hikes aren't for everybody. Um, but uh, it, it really, it's an entirely different lifestyle that, you know, the simplicity and adventure. Um, I don't know. It, it's something I miss, especially reading my brother's journal, who's now on the PCT. Um, but. Uh, you know, on the other hand, three through hikes was plenty for me. <laughs> yeah, Anders. Uh, you mentioned that you had like an extreme hiker hunger. If you would go into a trail town, what would a typical dinner look like? Uh, so let's talk about Anaconda, that trail, the trail town in Montana where I show those deers crossing the road. So when Snurgle and I reached the outskirts of town, we went into a grocery store and I headed straight for the freezer section. I, I really developed a passion for ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> so I ate six of those, a uh, gallon of orange juice um, and something else. And that was just to keep me going till dinner. <laughs> and then um, we stayed at a hostel in that town and they happened to have they were celebrating their one year anniversary. So basically got a free dinner there where I had a couple of hamburgers, you know, bags of chips, big piece of cake, a few beers. Um, and then, you know, half an hour later, I was hungry again. <laughs> What's that? No salad? I actually might have had some salad too. Yeah, basically hikers are on the seafood diet. The seafood, you eat it. <laughs> Yeah. In the desert, did you hike during the day at peak heat, or did you guys try to stay there in the morning? Yeah, I, I would get going at you know 5 a.m. in the in the desert, um, try to get you know a bunch of miles in. Um, the key is just to like you know use a lot of sunblock. Um, I had a hat, long sleeve shirt. Um, just try to you know keep as as little skin exposed as possible, and then you know try to find some shade where you could, but the shade was so sparse there. Like for example, that first 85 miles back to Lordsburg and the Chihuahua Desert, um, 
my navigation map actually had icons for each of the 13 trees that exist along the trail in those 85 miles. So um, yeah, shade was definitely at a premium, uh, particularly in southern New Mexico. So how did you charge your phone? Did you, did you have one of those little uh, sun? Uh... I didn't have a solar charger. I, I just uh, had a battery pack. Uh, it started with 10 um, milliwatt hours or whatever it was, milliamp hours. Um, so I charged that in town. That would give my iPhone about four charges. And then uh, somewhere in New Mexico, I actually bought it another five it's just to, you know, so I had basically 15 to, to keep me going between trail towns, which is usually like four or five days. Who were the best brands of shoes that you <laughs> <laughs> In terms of like comfort as well as, um, like your hip, yeah. as well as the terrain, like the yeah. combination. The most so almost everybody on the trails uses what's called trail runners. They're like ruggedized running shoes. Um, I used um, Cascadia's by Brooks. I found out about those in the AT. The, the first time I put a pair on, I hiked 20 miles that day and my feet felt perfect. And I just stuck with them ever since. But, you know, Cascadia's aren't for everybody. You know, some other, whatever, there's a bunch of other brands, Solomon's that people use. And, um, so it's, it's really something you have to kind of find out for yourself what the best shoe is. But um, typically a pair of shoes will last you about 500, 600 miles. I actually got 950 miles out of a pair of shoes in the PCT, but those shoes were like completely trashed at the end. They were literally held together with duct tape. Um, but... Um, so do you like order them online and then see what works in the back? In my case, I ordered a bunch ahead of time, and then my wife sent them to me along the trail as I went. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to say you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you did the triple crown. This is our triple crown of hearing you <laughs> talk about each of your, your hikes, and I'm just blown away every time. Um, could you talk a little bit about writing your blog and why that was important to you and what sort of did that keep you connected to or help illuminate what you were learning or seeing or learning about yourself along the, along the trail? Probably one of the best things I did in hiking these trails was to keep an online journal on trailjournals.com. Um, and I've, I've gone back, basically I would have one entry per day along with a picture. And it'd usually be four or five paragraphs on you know, what transpired each day. And I'd actually spend a lot of time while I was just walking along thinking about what I was gonna write that night. Um, and I've gone back and you know, spent so much time rereading those over and over again. Um, and uh, you know, after the AT, my, my mom, who was still alive at the time, she, uh, she urged me to write a book. Um, because she enjoyed reading my journal so much. And I, you know, there's a million books on the AT, so I promised her instead that if I finished the Triple Crown, that I would then try to write a book. So, um, so anyway, I'm in the process of, of, of taking material from my journals, but also kind of, I don't want to just like regurgitate that into a book. I want to actually, I'm kind of reorganizing the information. Um, and basically writing a book about the Triple Crown itself as opposed to one individual trail. Um, so anyway, I've got Mark Palmer, who lives on my street, who's a uh, whatever journalism writer um, and teacher who's helped me. Um, and I've got a little sidetrack with some other stuff going on, but um, I'm hopefully gonna get back to that soon and finish that off. That's great. Let's go ahead and question. Sure. So when you are in the wilderness and you really are disconnected from really the worries and the uh, noises of the universe, mm -hmm. you've just been a completely different zone. Given that you are alone and it's not that far away really from some level of civilization, and that civilization that you are in is like completely God country. Mm -hmm. 
Will you, and, and plus there's whole people at courses that could get to you and so on. Did you have any worry about, say, like, and then as you're approaching and going into the trail town, and you're faced with the fact that you're actually fairly close to these guns and people and what are potential dangers. Are you afraid at all? Um. I never really felt that afraid of the guns. Well, I'm just saying yeah. it might not be guns. It could be just someone drunk, oh. you know. I mean, frankly, probably the most afraid I was was some through hiker. I, I actually don't think he finished, but um, he had a serious alcohol problem. And when he would get into trail towns, he'd get like really drunk and start saying, you know, start acting belligerent and, uh, you know, dangerous. So. I mean, that person was probably the probably the most scared I felt, uh, you know, about anybody on the trail. So did you have something with you to defend yourself or something? Like that? No, <laughs> just just my brain, just you know, trying to talk my way out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. I would like to point out that in their the picture where the gentleman was surrounded by firearms. Mm -hmm. They were all hunting firearms. There wasn't yep. a single assault rifle there. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any item in your back? Well, how much in your backpack lay? I guess would be the first question. Then, is there something in the backpack that might surprise us? Mm -hmm. Like a, something that came in handy, or some type of tool, or start a fire? Or I mean, my backpack weighed maybe twenty-five pounds before resupply and you know after resupply 35 pounds something like that um, so they figured two pounds a day of food approximately um, I mean I, I was able to put everything in my backpack um, my tent sleeping bag sleeping pad I had it like a blow-up sleeping pad a lot of people just had those foam pads um, I had a bunch of stuff sacks so like all my clothes would be in one stuff sack and I don't know uh, water filtration stuff and another stuff sack. I basically had everything organized by stuff sack. And by the time, you know, I was a month into the trail, I knew where everything was and I put everything into the, the backpack the same order so that, it, you know, fair, so ba partly so I wouldn't lose anything, um, but partly also it just made it much more convenient to find things. Um, I don't think there is much that I had that might surprise you. I probably was a little light on the uh, first aid side of things, um, but uh, I don't know, a lot of ibuprofen I had in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask about that, about first aid and also emergency response, like when the old people go out, they have those settled cults. Yeah, probably about, I don't know, half the people or a third of the people had the whatever uh, devices where you could push a button yeah. to it's essentially like call a 911. And you could also send text messages through satellites. I did not have a satellite device, but there were enough people around that had them that, you know, if I really got in trouble, maybe within a couple of days, I could have made an emergency call if I needed it. Yep. How many people were your peers with regards to your age, percentage-wise? Um, well, there's one guy that I met in New Mexico who was quite a bit older than me, but there was no way he was going to finish on time. And I, the funny thing is I met the same guy in the PCT four years earlier. Um, but um, did he finish that? <laughs> I believe he did by, you know, jumping around and like he did Washington and then came back and did Oregon. But the CDT was, you know, he was, he was like two months in and he hadn't made it through New Mexico yet. So I don't think he was going to make it. Um, in terms of, so there's one guy I met who was like very proud of himself because he thought he was the oldest guy in the trail. And it turns out he was like 56. <laughs> <laughs> so he was pretty disappointed when he <laughs> realized I was 63. Um, yeah, as far as I know, I'm the oldest guy who finished, but I, I'm sure there were some other older people as well. Were most of them in their 20s and 30s? Or? Yeah, I'd say most people were in their 20s and 30s, um, but there were some people, there's definitely some people in 40s and 50s that I met. Not a whole lot of 60-year-olds. Yeah. That was a good uh, 
shot yet of that uh, moose you ran into. Oh, yeah. did, did you have any other notable interaction with the wildlife? So, um, I think it was up in Montana. Again, I was walking along through like a blowdown area, and um, all of a sudden I saw this, this bear who had obviously seen me, and he was racing the opposite direction through a blowdown. Like the blowdown that I showed you in the slide late in the presentation. This bear was going, I would estimate, 20 miles an hour in territory that I would have been going one mile an hour in. So I concluded that you know, there was no way I was going to escape a bear if he wanted to chase me. <laughs> um, and about 20 minutes later, I saw the exact same thing happen. Another bear, I think it was another bear, going in the same direction, running through the blowdown. Um, so that was pretty exciting to see, you know, some bears at high speed. It scared me, I don't know why, because they weighed about 400 pounds. Um, but uh, I'm not even sure I could have got my bear spray out and, you know, deployed it in time if, if they are actually coming in my direction. Yeah. So what kind of research and preparation did you have to do beforehand? Um, yeah, there's a lot of good online resources to um, you know, figure out what other people have done in the past. Um, so I, I did quite a bit of research um, in terms of like figuring out where I was going to resupply. Um, and uh, you know, I, I basically drew up a, like a list of all the resupply points and the points where I had to, to mail myself a package. So in that respect, I felt like you know, I was pretty well prepared for for the trail and, and also having done two other trails, I pretty much had my equipment and clothing needs locked down. So for example, I, I mean, I think I, I bought a warmer sleeping bag at one point when I got into Southern Colorado, but aside from that, there's really, oh, and I also bought, brought it, uh, or bought a new uh, air mattress because the one I had through New Mexico, after I got the fifth leak in it, I decided, you know what, I need a new one. Um, but uh, yeah, I pretty much had my equipment and clothing pretty well dialed in by the time I got to the CDT. And have you stayed in touch with the other um, through hikers? There must be a Facebook page or some mm -hmm. community where you all, you know, stay in touch. Yeah, so there's Facebook pages. Um, I've got, you know, phone numbers um, of probably 30, 40 people I met along the way. So when I went, when I get done, I went through all my pictures and, and got the pictures of all the people I met along the way, put all those pictures on a um, Google Drive, and I texted all those people um, saying, you know, here's pictures of each of you. Um, and there's actually going to be a CDT reunion um, this September that I think I'm going to go to. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. On a ridge <laughs> <laughs> It's actually going to be in Kentucky. One of the guys in there. <laughs> right. Well, thanks everybody for coming. It was great.